So for our, our panel series, our first guest speaker, Mr. Oh my gosh, sorry, David George Gordon, the bug chef, um, to speak more on the subject of entomophagy. All right. Well, I really appreciate everyone having me here today. And uh, it's great to talk about something I'm very passionate about. And that fancy word up there, I, I would pronounce this entomophagy. It basically means bug eating. And you know, bug eating to me sounds kind of rednecky. So if you say, I engaged in entomophagy, that sounds very highborn. And you can explain to people, well, that actually means I ate a bug. Oops, hold on. Okay, I, I want to make this very short, so I will probably touch on a lot more than I'm actually going to, there we go, that I'm actually going to be able to get across in 15 minutes, but, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not getting an advance on this. Pointing in the right direction. Can I do it on this? No. We're stuck. Stop the clock. All right. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. When we're talking about bug eating, we're not talking about this. These are bugs eating, right? <laughs> There's actually a, a diorama of cockroaches having a Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> but we're actually talking about this. And 80% of the world's cultures eat some kind of bug. It's kind of sobering. 1.9 billion people is what the statistics say, probably larger than that. Um, we're in that 20% as Westerners that don't eat bugs, and we think it's weird. But we're actually in a vast minority. If you go to a place like, well, this picture is from Oaxaca, Mexico, a market. That pile there, those piles, those are not chilies. Those are grasshoppers, like the ones we had today, chapolines. And they're roasted, wild harvested, uh, roasted, seasoned with chili and lime and salt and offered for sale in the markets. These are pre-Hispanic snacks. People have been eating these for thousands of years well before Columbus arrived and observed the scene. So for those cultures that eat bugs, it's literally a heritage food. It's not like these people are so uh, starving for protein that they're desperate, they'll eat anything. That's kind of like saying, well, we'll eat, we're so starving that we'll eat oysters on a half shell. It's not a desperation food. It's a, it's a comfort food, actually. Um, if you look in the Bible, our forebears were eating bugs. This is John the Baptist. You, I always say he's the most best known bug eater on the planet. Um, he lived on a diet of locusts and honey. So he was eating bugs. And he was a kind of a back to earth hippie kind of guy. He lived in a cave, uh, wore animal hides. But he's uh, definitely out there. If you read the Bible, the Old Testament, it actually says that locusts are kosher. So it says everything else in the insect world is an abomination. But locusts were okay, big swarms of locusts. I started getting into this topic and I wondered why is it that we stopped eating bugs, that our Western society stopped eating bugs. And as best I can see, it had a lot to do with the advent of agriculture. As soon as people stopped being hunters and gatherers and opportunists and started really focusing on crops and livestock, now bugs were the uh, obstacle. In fact, it's a fun fact that insects are the only animals that are in direct competition with people for food. So if a swarm of locusts comes by your wheat field, look out. You know, we have to worry about that. Or, you know, could infest your, your uh, cattle or what have you. So a lot of our disdain for eating insects comes from that. It's like a, a propaganda negative campaign. Um, throughout the years, there have been people who have been trying to get people to eat bugs. Uh, this is a book by Vincent Holt from the 1880s in England. Um, Holt was arguing that, that if this was during a time, I like it because it's around the same issues today, food insecurity. If you think about it, there are these big 
famines, potato famines, several of them uh, in Europe. And he was saying people don't need to be starving. They could be eating these healthful bugs. He wasn't saying everyone should eat them. He was saying the rich people could enjoy their steak, but the servants could be eating bugs. That was his idea of a, a nice, humble solution. He even had menus and a few recipes in this book. Surprisingly, there's only one copy of this book in existence today. It's in a museum, in a library in England. But you can actually find the copies of that as a Google book. It's worth reading, definitely. Well, I wrote this book, The Eat a Bug Cookbook, 20 years ago, 1998. This is actually the revised edition with a snappier cover. But I was kind of following in Vincent Holt's perspective. I wanted people to understand that insects were more than things you should just swat at, and um, that they could actually build whole meal plans around insects. Um, of course, there are all these benefits. I don't want to get into them too much right now. The insects are rich in protein, they have vitamins and minerals, uh, amino acids you might not find anywhere else. Um, for example, the uh, ancient Aztecs in Mexico, they would actually sell ears of corn in the market if they were infested with corn earworm, that's a kind of caterpillar, they would sell them for more money than just plain old corn. And there was logic to that, as there often is with the ancestral foods. If you just eat corn, you're not getting the amino acid lysine. You'd be deficient, lysine deficient. If you're eating bugs and corn, now you're getting a balanced amino acid panel. So my book has 40 recipes in it. Here's my, probably one of my favorites, Orthoptera and Orzo. That's Orzo pasta with crickets, cricket nymphs, which I find are a little more tender and tastier than the adults. Um, I've actually had a kid come back for fifths on this dish when I was giving a public program. And when I said, don't they feed you at home? He said, this is way better than anything my mom makes. <laughs> I've always used that as my great uh, triumph. And of course, the food photography in this book is fabulous. I love working with food photographers. Um, this is a, these are tomato hornworms. You might know them as green, the large green caterpillars. When you cook them, they actually lose that green in color and become a whitish color. Um, since my book came out in 98, over the last 20 years, I've done a lot of wild experiences. It used to be I was like the only bug chef in town. If you don't like my cooking, get yourself another bug chef. Now there are actually bunches of them. Um, so I did a, a food truck at San Diego Comic-Con one year. I've done programs at Microsoft, uh, their campus up in the Seattle area. And probably my real claim to fame was doing a bug banquet at, for the Explorers Club in New York. Every year they have a kind of a bizarre foods uh, cocktail hour. And rather than just focusing on bizarre, they wanted to do something about sustainable uh, eating of insects. So they hired me to put together actually the $15,000 budget just for the bugs, not the lettuce that went with them. Um, one of the guests was Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> so yeah, that's my claim to fame. I fed a uh, deep fried tarantula spider to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Now, when we talk about entomophagy, uh, you know, I were like, how many of you have eaten a bug before? In California, a lot of people have. But in reality, we've all eaten bugs before because there are bugs in a lot of our everyday foods. They're actually what are called food defect action levels that the uh, health organizations have created. If you have a certain number of bugs in thing, any processed food, jams or jellies, peanut butter, the story about this ketchup bottle, if you look at the, there's a little label around the neck. This is left over from the days when we weren't that great at homogenizing food and the bugs would rise to the top, look kind of gross. Someone said, well, we'll put a band around it to conceal that. First person to use the ketchup will get all that glop and then everything will be fine. And you know, now we're 100 years later, there's still a band around ketchup bottles. Kind of cracks me up. When you get right, right down to it though, we eat all sorts of weird food. It's basically what I've discovered from my own research, if your parents or your grandparents gave it to you, then it's a comfort food. Pickled pig seed, for example. Um, and it's also interesting to me that our tastes change over time. Um, my favorite example of sort of trendy foods, the lobster. 
and you know when when the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock they were grossed out by lobsters they didn't eat them they actually would plow them into the farm fields as fertilizer and you can actually read um, diaries from the pilgrims you know the Smiths came over last night and we were so reduced that we had to serve them lobsters they did not like it in fact they've actually in New England they passed legislation in the 1930s limiting the number of times you could feed lobster to prisoners in the state prisons <laughs> kind of wild now the last time I had a lobster was fifty dollars and I wound up sharing it with two of my friends so you know how do you accommodate or account for these trends it's very difficult things like let's say the word take the word uh, chipotle it's everywhere now it wasn't 10 or 15 years ago and you know there's a restaurant chain you can get chipotle flavored everything ice cream you name it so what drives these trends uh, I'd like to know because of course insects are one of those things that's kind of becoming trendy in a very unusual way nowadays more and more people are interested in incorporating insects at least as an experiment into their diets and as, as I was saying we eat all sorts of weird things but we don't necessarily regard them as weird so there's a strong cultural aspect to all of this if I if I wanted to pick out one weird food totally gross what is it that's right the chicken egg where does it come from that's right the butt of a chicken um, it's literally the menses the period of the chicken they pass an egg every day women sounds familiar right now is that gross anyone out no we all eat eggs it's part of our cultural tradition if I said tomorrow we're gonna have turtle eggs or iguana eggs or something like that people would be grossed out it's like chicken eggs are good why iguana eggs are bad why it's hard to figure so if you can eat something bizarre like a chicken egg it's only a matter of time, of course, and determination before you could have a grasshopper kebab, one of the recipes in my book. I call these sheesh kebabs. Okay, now things really kicked up a notch in 2013. That was six years ago. This publication came out. It was produced by the Food and Agriculture Organization from the UN. It's a branch of the UN. It's a 180-page report. It's not just a little pamphlet. And it's talking about, in large part, the very fact that the population of our planet is growing so rapidly. I suspect you already know this. There's going to be another 2 billion people on the planet over the next 50 years. And even if we wanted to give everyone a hamburger, we couldn't. The, the land that's available, um, the resources that go into that hamburger, the water and the food, it's just not sustainable. So this FAO report was looking at and proclaiming that we needed to start raising more insects, not just harvesting them from the wild, but actually having insect farms. And um, as an alternative, raising and eating insects. Uh, that really attracted a great amount of press, uh, media attention, which was kind of cool. Um, it inspired my publisher to re-release my book. It had been in print all that time, but they gave a, a nice ritzy treatment uh, of kind of a, something to appeal to foodies. Um, but this report was really a major turning point. Uh, New York Times ran the story. A lot of the publications started running stories. And now it's kind of a conversation that's actually gotten quite sophisticated by the media. They're not just going, oh, bugs. They're actually talking about the, you know, the value of farming and uh, what's going to work and how do you change people's attitudes and so on. Uh, I focus a lot based on their books, uh, their report summary on what's wrong with our current system. These feedlots, I always drive through some of them as I'm in California and I can usually smell them a mile away before I actually the windows roll down before I get to any range of one. There are lots of, what's wrong with this picture? Well, for one thing, there's lots of uh, waste in terms of food and water. It turns out it takes about 2,000 gallons of water to get one pound of steak, in terms of raising the crops these animals eat and drinking water themselves. So almost 2,000 gallons, that's a lot. Um, it also takes about 15 or 16 pounds of grain if you're having grain-fed cattle. 
um, to get one pound of meat. If we did this with insects, some insects don't need water at all. They literally get their water molecules by breaking down carbohydrates, like in a granary. Those mealworms that we are serving today, they don't need much water at all. Um, a pound of crickets probably requires a lot, around a gallon of water, period. So kind of amazing, you, you choose. Uh, but what also is wrong here is there's, we were talking about mammals, and they're not that different from ourselves. And there's a great possibility of disease that can spread to humans. And remember mad cow disease? That was quite the, the media scare a while back. That's something that could pass over. Same thing with you know swine flu or uh, chicken viruses or things like that. You can't really get that by eating insects. It's just too distant uh, a leap there. And there are very few parasites, for example, that can even make that passage from a cold-blooded animal to a warm-blooded animal. The other thing, this is my favorite slide in this entire presentation. Cattle produce an amazing amount of greenhouse gas emissions through uh, methane and, uh, and ammonia gases, uh, through their poop and their flatulence. I guess that's a scientific term for farting, right? <laughs> Okay, those gases go up and actually form the greenhouse layer of gases in the upper atmosphere. Uh, they call them greenhouse gases, maybe you know this, because they let in uh, sunlight and heat, but they don't let it back out. Just like the panes of glass in a greenhouse, you know, if you go into a greenhouse, even on a cold day, it's warmer in there. Okay, now all of these things, as I said, inspired a great dialogue, and it's become very uh, sophisticated. This is an article from Sierra Magazine. Um, I actually have been going through stuff as I continue to, to downsize, and I've been throwing away boxes of clippings that have been written on this topic. Uh, so it's definitely a subject of great discussion. I would also say it's interesting to me that there are more and more people, in large part inspired, I would like to think, by my public programs and cooking demos, but probably more likely by the FAO report for getting into the industry of raising crickets for human consumption, or I should say insects for human consumption. For the current time, it's mostly about three or four different species. And we're talking about crickets, mealworms, wax worms, which are caterpillars, um, and locusts. Those are the ones that seem to be most easily cultivated. They have been cultivated for about 50 or 60 years primarily for pet food or for bait and tackle shops. So it's not been that difficult for people to modify their practices to make them available for human beings. Uh, you can now get organic crickets from a cricket farm. You can even get, I love this, at first I thought we must be joking, um, gluten-free crickets. <laughs> they don't feed them gluten in their diets, okay. So you can find things nowadays in grocery stores like these are Chapool energy bars. Uh, we have those cricket cookies out there. People take crickets, for example, they roast them, they grind them up, they make kind of a flour or a powder, and you can incorporate that in everything from baked goods and smoothies and you name it, and suddenly you're adding all this nutrition, um, a lot of protein, a lot of vitamins and minerals, like I said. Uh, it's also funny, if you go online, you can find cans of black ants. You know, all these things, you can buy dried tarantulas if you want, uh, go online. Actually, one of my favorite stores, I'll put in a plug, is called Ento Sense. It's like sense, like in logic. And um, they have an amazing catalog of bugs from around the world. Um, most of them are dried. I don't think it's the same as when you're actually there eating them, but they are available and easily obtained online. In Seattle, where I live, Edgar's Cantina, it was actually a, it's a, one of the vendors in the, uh, what used to be known as Safeco Field, the baseball, where the Seattle Mariners play baseball. They've been serving chapolines, those little grasshoppers, uh, in four ounce cups, about $5 a pop. And it's amazing, the first three games that they started selling these, they sold out. They actually had a limit but Edgar's Cantina had to limit the number of, of uh, chapolines, grass, roasted grasshoppers that they were selling to uh, 
they sold 314 cups a game. That was Edgar Martinez, their designated hitter's batting average. Over the course of one year, they sold 1,550 pounds of these chapolinas. So yes, it's gone way beyond a novelty food. These are some of the guys enjoying the Mariners game. You can see the woman is holding a little cup. Goes well with a beer. Uh, okay, there's also been the rise of sort of celebrity chefs who are cooking. This is a good friend of mine, Joseph Yoon. He's actually torching some scorpions, small scorpions. And he's like, you see these people on TV a lot. Uh, there's actually a Smithsonian series called Bug Bites that Joseph and I were both in. Um, here's another one. This is Allie Moore. She's a chef in Los Angeles. Um, she does a lot of wine and bug tastings. So it's becoming more and more of a thing. The thing that's funny though is we're still dealing with this. People really have an innate disgust of insects. And I kind of feel that it's unfortunate that they're uh, so weird about this. They're not doing any great service by, by uh, dissing bugs. But it's an innate thing for a lot of Westerners. And it's an obstacle we really need to overcome if we're going to continue to feed all the people on this planet. So I kind of wonder, just following the trend, is this where fast food is going? Are you going to be able to drive through and say, I'd like a side of flies with that? We don't know. It's really hard to predict. It's really hard to predict food trends. But the amount of growth that I've seen in interest and actually in carrying out some of these uh, aspects of entomophagy has been amazing over the last 20 years. It's gone from me being the one weirdo in the room to an actual uh, convention that has 150 or 200 people that are uh, all in some aspect of the inedible insect industry. Industry? That wasn't even on the radar when I started. Okay, well that's really what I want to say, so I'm going to turn up the microphone over to our next speaker. Thank you.